You know, one day somebody might ask us, you know, how do we pay a building off so quick? It's because we've got people chasing people down the aisles to give in their offering, right? <laughs> My goodness. If that wouldn't warm a pastor's heart, I don't know what will, man. That's, two people had to chase them down. It's good stuff. Oh, funny, funny. All righty. We are in Exodus 12. Uh, we're going to be starting at verse 21 tonight, where we left off. Um, you know me, wanted to get farther last week, but somebody just keeps talking, and we never get through them, right? So uh, Exodus 12, we are in the uh, kind of the 10th plague. Uh, the 10th plague has not happened yet, um, but we've kind of got this beginning a story of really what's going to happen. Remember, the 10th plague, even though it's the last plague, it's the plague in which Moses was told first about. All the way back um, in Exodus uh, 3 and 4, uh, if you remember, um, he says that you are my firstborn, and because of that, I, um, I will hurt the firstborn of Pharaoh. And so this is kind of the 10th plague is... Um, the end, but it's kind of the beginning. And so we kind of have the beginning of the end coming forth. And so last week, looking at this of chapter uh, 11 and getting into the beginning of chapter 12, uh, we've learned that they're going to have this Passover. We learned um, that they were going to have to um, take the lambs. So we talked a little bit about the Passover, a little bit about the lamb. Um, and remember, they were going to have to um, slay it. It was going to uh, if you remember, they were going to have to buy it on the 10th, right? They were going to just bring it into their house on the 10th, live with it for four days inside of their house, and then uh, at midnight on the 14th day of the month, uh, they were going to have to slay it, uh, drain the blood out, and then paint it over their doorpost. And at this time, uh, they learned about that they were going to have to make bread um, without leaven, right? They were going to have to make tortillas, and so, uh, and they were going to have to do this. So we've kind of got this precursor of really what everybody knows to be Passover and what everybody knows the 10th plague to be, um, but once again, the plague hasn't happened yet, right? So when you get this in your mind, and I think this is a lot of part that we kind of just um, read past because we think kind of timeline, we think spatially, and so we have this, but just think about that God has said, here's what you're going to have to do, here's what's coming, you're going to have to do this, you're going to have to do this, and now today we're getting to the point, and all these things that God said that they're going to have to do is really going to make sense because it actually happens. And so um, kind of the idea of one, not just a prophetic statement what God is doing, but also an idea of God says, here's what you need to do. You need to have uh, your lamb ready. You need to have um, your house without leaven. You need to have your unleavened bread break. All this stuff because it will, be, uh, it will be needed when the actual plague happens, right? So when the plague happens and Egypt tells them to leave, they would not have had time, right? They would have gone without any kind of bread. They wouldn't have had time to get the leavened bread and to bake it. So not only was it a prophetic statement of the future, it was really God getting them ready because the, the final moment of the exodus was going to be so quick uh, and needed. So we kind of see God says, here, have a little bit of faith, right? Here's what I want you to do. But faith, James 2, what requires work, so it requires actions. And so God says, be ready. They got ready, right? And so that's kind of where we uh, ended up. And so in verse 21, uh, we'll kind of pick up there. Uh, then Moses called to the elders of Israel and said to them, right? So remember, we looked at last week this idea uh, of the, kind of the beginning that Israel, the congregation of Israel, uh, as, as it, we just saw last week as it's called, but we'll see that word all the way through, um, all the, way through the Old Testament from this point forward, um, but we kind of see the beginning of kind of this, this group, this nation, this religious group of people. And so this, re, this kind of congregation of Israel, what happens? He calls the elders of Israel. Uh, elders is not just old people, okay? Uh, it, it's what we think of today. It means uh, maturity. It means leadership, right? So um, even in their slavery forms, they would have had some system of how they would communicate, how they would advise. 
Um, you would imagine that in their uh, 429 years of slavery up to this point, um, they, they've kind of worked this out, right? Even though they're slaves, remember, they live completely kind of different, Egypt, Goshen, right? Kind of have um, that idea. And so they would have had, even in slavery, kind of a system in which um, things would have worked, right? They, not necessarily like a mayor uh, and a sheriff, um, but there would have been some kind of structure that if things would have been ordered, how would they have known, right? It's not like everybody got a max text message that says, hey, today we're making bricks without straw, right? There would have been some kind of system um, where they would have, where Pharaoh or Pharaoh's taskmasters would have told some leaders in Israel and that word would have passed down. Well, Moses is kind of jumping on the back of that. Uh, and he calls these elders of Israel, these leaders of Israel, and said to them, Go and select the lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of that door of his, of his house until morning, right? So here he says, right, get your lambs, get ready, we're going to do it, we're going to kill it all, we're going to kill the lamb, we're going to drain the blood, put it in a bowl. But notice it says a bunch of hyssop. Now, once again, uh, the Passover is the beginning of a lot of things throughout all of Scripture. Um, and hyssop is one of those things. And so when it says take a bunch of hyssop, almost every time after this moment, after Passover, um, where we first kind of see hyssop being used and being talked about in Scripture. But every point after this, we see that hyssop is almost always used uh, in the sense of applying blood um, or the cleansing of sin. It's always involved in a sacrifice. It's always kind of used in purifying something. Uh, and I've got a couple of verses here, but the, there, there's, there's hundreds. Um, but like in Leviticus chapter 14, 6, the ceremony for cleansing of a limper, uh, a leper was, well, I don't know what a limper is, but a leper uh, is to use hyssop to apply blood. Numbers chapter 19, hyssop was used to make the ashes of a red heifer uh, for water purification. It means to purify something. Numbers chapter 19, verse 18, hyssop was used to uh, apply the purified water. Psalms 51, verse 7, David in his great psalm of repentance said, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Uh, in John chapter 19, we see that even Jesus was offered the sour wine at the very end of his crucifixion, and it was on hyssop, this idea of, uh, of a sacrifice, of being purified. And so we see the beginning of hyssop, which is just a bush with some branches. It's not too long, uh, but you kind of have this. But we can see from this moment, remember, remember, people read their Bibles, right, especially Israel. They would have started Genesis, and they would have worked all the way through, right? So as they're reading through the Pentateuch, and they see hyssop here, and now every point forward, any Jew that would read anything, and it would mention hyssop, not only was it about uh, sacrifice, not only was it about purification, uh, it was always that picture of going back to applying the blood to the doorpost, right? So it gets this picture, right? So uh, it's just kind of an interesting kind of, kind of jeopardy thing there for you. Um, so if you're on a bus with Miss Corrine and a question is about hyssop, okay, just, just go for purification. It's probably right, right? So whatever the answer is. Uh, verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer, destroyer to enter your house to strike you. Notice there in verse 23, it says, uh, um, when the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood, he sees the blood. This is a very important line, right? He sees the blood. The Lord looked for blood. It wasn't the marker. It wasn't paint. It wasn't for race. It wasn't that they were uh, Hebrew. He was looking for blood. Israel deserved, okay, this is important to understand all the Passover, Israel deserved uh, the judgment of death just as much as the Egyptians did, okay? 
They all deserve death. But the Israels had to dab the blood on the doorpost, paint the doorpost, um, to, to show that they were as guilty as the Egyptians, right? Don't get in this mind frame that Israel is always right and the Egyptians were wrong. No, they both are sinners, right? They both apply and have the sin of Adam upon them, right? But it was the blood, it was the sacrifice that the Lord was looking for. Uh, so they needed a substitute to die. That's why the Lord passed over, right? So get in your mind, Passover. It's not that God hates the Egyptians. God hates those who do not listen to him, that, who have a heart against God. And that's Israel also, right? So Israel was not always the greatest, right? The, at the beginning, we're with you, Moses. And Moses goes and says, now you've got to collect your own straw. Oh, we don't like you, God, anymore, right? I mean, we've already seen this. And this will be true all the way of Israel, right? All the way until Jesus comes back, okay? It's just kind of true. And it's true of us, right? We have moments where we love God, and we have moments that we disobey God. And we, we don't like God at times, right? So we kind of have this, this idea. So this blood is very important. He sees the blood in every home in Egypt, in in Goshen, right, which is where the Israel is at, remember this, the death count was the same. In every home in Egypt and in Goshen where Israel, the death count was the same. In every home, one thing died in every home. It was either a lamb or it was the firstborn, okay? There was one for one. Everything died. Every household, there was a death, right? But was it the death or was it the sacrifice, right? Death has to come. There has to be a punishment, okay? This is important when you build up your theology for the cross, right, that we will eventually get to one day when we get all the way through the Bible, right, when we get to, uh, get to the cross. But uh, this is so much so. The, de the lamb is a substitute for the firstborn. If the blood were simply marking out Israelites' home, any marker would have done. Um, some of this I said last week. It's kind of why I'm skirting through it. Um, but the blood is a sign that the sacrifice had been made, uh, and that the substitute had been offered, right? It, they they, they could have used anything, right? They could have done a sock on a door. They could have just wrote some uh, Hebrew words. They could have wrote the name of Yahweh on their door. They could have used red paint. They could have used clay-tinted water. Uh, they they could have put anything on the door. The important was he sees the blood. The most important thing that God was looking for was the blood, and that's so important as you get your mind around what the Passover is and as the Passover moves forward and then eventually we see uh, Jesus fulfilling the Passover, right? Uh, the lamb, uh, so, so why the lamb, right? The, the lamb, it was a sacrifice, but notice the lamb is not a fair exchange for the human life. No matter who you are, no matter if you're Egyptian or Israel, no matter what race, color, whatever, a lamb, an animal, is not equal to a human life, right? So for those who did not believe, okay, the Egyptians, and, and there would have been many, if you ever remember at the beginning, Egypt was, was uh, three to one, right? For every Egyptian, there were three other people in Egypt, right? So Egypt was really just a, a multitude, a melting pot. But in this time, uh, during this Passover, this lamb was not a fair exchange, right? So they painted the, the blood of the lamb, and it passed their house. It, it skipped a human death because the lamb's death was its sacrifice. But that's not fair, right? That, that, that's, that's not equal. You don't say, hey, okay, I did bad. I know I'm supposed to die, but we could do a lamb. Could you imagine somebody doing something super horrible and they get the death sentence and in jail they say, you know what, I don't really want to die. Um, just hook a lamb up to the electric chair. And everybody's like, that'll work. That's wonderful, right? We're like, no, fry that sucker, right? You're like, no way. You're like, no, we, we, want, we want restitution, right? We want, we want judgment. We want this to be done. He deserved death. He gets to do death. But here, the lamb was not a fair exchange, but the lamb was simply a pointer of an embodied promise of a true substitute. 
And so what I mean by that is the lamb is saying, you know what, it's not fair. It, it, the lamb is not a fair substitute for a human, and that's why we've heard in the previous verses last week, and we'll continue to hear as we move forward, that the Passover has to happen every year because it's not fair, right? It's not fair. It, it needs to keep going. It, the lamb isn't enough. It needs more and more and more and more. The Passover is a sign that there is something greater to come, right? That this lamb that they, that they, that they sacrifice and that they um, use the blood year after year, this sacrifice has been made, it's pointing to a time that sometime in the future they will not have to do this anymore. The Passover will be finished. There will be something that is greater that finishes the work of redemption, of seeing the blood. And so with that in mind, that in your mind, put your mind into a Jew when Jesus comes on the scene. And in John chapter 1, verse 29, Jesus comes down to the Jordan River to see John the Baptist, the, the, uh, the, the prophet, the Elijah type that says, here comes the Messiah. And when John the Baptist sees Jesus in chapter 1, verse 29, what does he say? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins. For thousands of years, they've been looking at this Passover lamb over and over and over, and it doesn't take away the sins. It just kind of, just kind of keeps it, right? It doesn't secure it. It doesn't finish it. It keeps going. And when John the Baptist says Jesus, he says, Look, the lamb, the Passover lamb of God who will finish Passover, who will completely wipe away uh, the penalty that we have, right? So you put your mind in a little Jewish thought. Um, when we see that, oh, it's just a great verse, right? Oh, look, the lamb. But it meant so much because any time that even though they had lambs and goats, and it's very popular, and if you go Middle East today, they're still rampant. They're everywhere in the wild, uh, and the Bedouins kind of farm them everywhere. Um, but even then, when you, have, when you say lamb to a Jew, even though they eat it all the time, it will always bring up the remembrance of Passover. It's embedded in them. It's, it's, it's their, their faith is, 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 um, is so purposeful stated on the lamb. And so when John the Baptist says, look, the lamb of God, look, the Passover lamb of God, who finally takes away the sins, right, that we've been trying to do for thousands of years, right? So... Um, more than you paid for, but there you go, right? So uh, uh, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house to strike you. Verse 24, you shall observe this right as a statue for you and your sons forever. The deliverance of Passover was not just for those Israelites in Egypt, right? We, we saw this last week, uh, but it's also for their children. It's also for their generations to follow. As you're reading through Exodus, as we're doing, right? But if you're that, that Jew who's reading through, we've seen this before, right? We've seen that God is talking about the plagues is going to show all of Egypt, right? The plagues are there to show Israel. Then it's going to show all the world, and then it's going to show all the generations. Well, now we can see this same type of talk is used about the Passover. It's not just for Israel now. It's not just for Israel tomorrow, but it's for Israel forever to come. It's for all way, for everybody, forever to come, the generations, right? Um, the Passover was the greatest work of redemption performed in the Old Testament, that side of the cross, right? So the Passover uh, is, is as close to the cross as Israel would get, right? But it pointed, it alluded to always uh, to the cross. In the same way, Jesus gave the new Passover, saying that his work on the cross was not only that of, the, uh, not for that generation, but should be remembered and applied to all generations. And that's the same reason that we get together and we take the Lord's Supper, right? It is that we proclaim uh, the cross, that we proclaim the new Passover um, forever, right? We don't do it just for us right now. We do it for the kids that are sitting in our pew. We, we do it for the lost people that are sitting in the pews with us. 
um, that we will do this. You've seen probably uh, your family do that, and hopefully our kids will do that, and their kids will do that, and their kids will do that because it's a promise of for future generations, right? So it's just kind of the, the same thing. Uh, verse 25, and when you come into the land, when you come into Canaan, when you come into Israel, when you come into the promised land, notice that's not right now, okay? That's not right now. They're still in Egypt, right? But he's saying when you come into the land that I've promised to Abraham, when you come into Israel, that will be many years after this, right? It'll, it will be 40, it'll be plus 40 years until they come into that land, right? Once again, God is giving a little prophecy that they will make it, right? He already told Abraham, right, the land that you see I will give to your children, uh, right? We, we have that promise, and now here he's saying when you come into that land, you will see that land, but notice every person in right, that's right here in Egypt, they, they will not see the promised land. They will die before they see the promised land, Right? before they move into the promised land, except for two, right? Joshua and Aaron, right? You kind of have that idea. And so when they come into the promised land, a little prophecy, and when you come into the land that the Lord has given you, as he has promised, you shall keep on, uh, you shall keep the service. So even when you come into the promised land, when you get to the place that God says, you're still going to keep the Passover. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he has passed over the house of the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt, and when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses, right? Just like today. You have little kids in here and you start passing around plates, right? You have guys walking up and down the aisle, which doesn't happen often in our church, but it does, and you pass, and right now you have that little cellophane, and you have that nasty piece of styrofoam that we call a cracker, uh, and you know, you're trying to open that tin foil without spilling the juice, and you have a little kid there, dad, what's that? Mom, what are you doing? Can I have some? I'm hungry. I need a snack. You're like, can I get some fruit snacks? You know, like, you know, what, you know, what's going to happen, right? Um, I, I've, I've in my ministry a lot of times, when we do Lord's Supper, we try to let people know, and, and even uh, I know parents who would bring like a, a, a sippy cup of juice and like some saltines, right, for their little bitty kid, even though it's not the Lord's Supper, but it, it's there and they're teaching about it as they're talking about it, right? So it, it's the same kind of idea that we do today and that you probably did with your kids at some point um, that, that, that we're seeing now. So when your children say, Mom and Dad, what are you doing? It is a sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over uh, the houses of the people of Israel, and he struck the Egyptians, but he spared our houses. Right? So it really tells. The Passover tells us two things. One, right, that, uh, that the enemy was defeated, right? Uh, Egypt was defeated. God struck the Egyptians. The bad people were taken care of. But secondly, it tells us that God's people were set free and given a new identity, a new birth, right? They, they get a whole new uh, nation. They get new promises, a new walk, a new life, right? He delivered them, right? So when they talk about Passover, it's God is good, and he, 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 uh, he struck down those who oppressed those, those who were against him, and he, give us, he gave us a new life. Mom, Dad, what, what's, why are they passing the gold plates? Well, it's a remembrance uh, of Jesus on the cross. Well, what was that about? Well, you know what? That, that one day God is going to have everybody, and anybody who doesn't love God and doesn't have a faith in God, he's going to send them to hell. He's going to strike them down. But for anybody who believes, he's given us a new life. He sent the Holy Spirit inside of us, and Jesus lives in our heart, and he allows us to, to, to move and to operate with him in there. So now Jesus is in my heart, and he guides my walk, and he guides what I do, and he guides my thoughts, and he guides my parenting. It's the same thing, right? It's the same conversation that we have now that they had thousands of years ago, right? It's the exact same thing. It's such a great picture. Um, um, uh, and, and, uh, and the people bowed their heads and worship. Notice this. This is important, right? This is kind of one of the things that we just read over. When, it, when you're reading this, you shall say the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, for he passed over the houses of people of Israel and Egypt, and he struck the Egyptians and spared our houses, and the people bowed their heads and worship. The immediate reaction of Israel to this announcement 
was to worship, right? The immediate reaction when he says, this is what you need to do. You need to get the lamb. You need to brush it on the door. You need to eat this. You need to do this. Okay, it's game time. God's coming. Are you ready? Let's go. And immediately they did what he said. This is important because there's not too many times in all of the Bible that you can say, God said do this, and it says Israel immediately reacted. Okay? Because we're going to see... Not been too many times after this, Israel's like, oh, I don't want to. I don't like this. This isn't my, right? They complained, right? This is what they were known to do. And so there's not too many times, but here we can see that they bowed their heads and they worshiped. Verse 28, then the people of Israel went and did so. Um, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did, right? So not only did they bow their heads in worship, um, but they went and did so. James chapter 2, verse 17. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead, okay? Their works proved their faith, right? It's not because they... they cut the lamb, caught the blood, smeared it on the door, ate all of the, all of the meat, any meat that was left over. Uh, they burnt it the next morning. It's not because they got all the leaven out. It's not, they were not saved by the actions. Okay? They were not by saved by doing the work of the Passover. They were saved by the faith of saying, today you will be delivered. These are the things you need to do to be delivered. And they said, yes, Lord. Right? And so it's the works that prove their faith, right? Not, uh, not the other way around. And, and so we can see the people of Israel went and did so, uh, and um, at, just as Moses and Aaron uh, did. So verse 29, we actually get into the actual plague. All of this is kind of what we call the prequel, right? We, now we kind of know what's happening. Now we actually get to see what happens. Uh, verse 29, uh, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn of the land of Egypt from the firstborn of, <clears throat> excuse me, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of the livestock. Notice it says, the midnight, the Lord struck down all of the firstborn. Exodus chapter 3, we looked at this months ago, right? Um, chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by my mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. And after that, he will let you go, right? We saw the end at the beginning, right? And so now we're here, the 10th plague. Um, and it says, he struck down, but notice it says, um, the, from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the captive who is in the dungeon, that word dungeon is the word pit houses. That's how you would actually transliterate it. Pit houses. And this means pit, right? Pits were dungeons back in then. They would dig holes, um, just kind of like a big, basically a big hole in the ground that would ramp down that they could just put one singular thing over uh, the door and it would kind of keep them in there. Uh, and so we kind of have this. But notice we see a difference. If you remember last week, Moses told Pharaoh that this is going to affect from Pharaoh until the, to the mill girl. You remember that? And the, that was the, the youngest uh, and the poorest and the um, kind of worst job as a servant girl. You would sit there with little rocks and you would mill out your corn and your wheat. Uh, and it was just something that like little three, four, five-year-old girls would do as they were, as they were um, brought into slaves, right? They, all slave girls w would do that. And so he said, it's going to affect you from, from Pharaoh to this little mill girl. But now we see a difference. It's going to affect Pharaoh sitting on his throne to, uh, to those who are captive in the pits, in the dungeons, right? So it, now it's below a servant. So we can see that this is not just a, um, a plague upon Egypt, even though P Egypt is the, is the place. Um, but remember, Egypt is three to one, right? For every one Egyptian, there's three other um, countrymen, uh, three other um, immigrants that are in Egypt. And so many of those who are in dungeons would have been POWs. They would have been from wars and conquest and people within the city who are trying to uprise against Egypt. And so this isn't just against Egypt. This is against anybody. So you have those who, have, who believe in God and put faith in the Passover and did the works to prove their faith and those who did not work, right? So it's not a race. 
Uh, it's not a culture. Uh, it's not a skin color. It's simply to those who have faith and those who do not, right? So, we, so there's a difference, but there's a reason there's a difference. Um, so those are captive in the dungeon. Um, but notice, once again, it's the firstborn. We've talked about this several times, but it's the firstborn of Pharaoh. It's the firstborn of those who are in dungeons. And it's the firstborn of the livestock. And so basically, when it says the firstborn, this plague, um, this plague is directed against two significant Egyptian gods. And we talked a little bit about this last week. Um, you have First, you have um, Osiris, who is the Egyptian god to be the giver of life. Um, so is this the God that would keep you alive, right? So every household um, in and around Egypt is going to be affected, right? So this God who gives life is really going to not do well, right? They could not give life to literally one household in all of the country. Um, kind of defeats that God. But secondly, it is against the God of Pharaoh. Remember, Pharaoh is the son of Ra. Uh, Pharaoh is not just a man. He's not just... Um, somebody, he, he ultimately was a god. He was to be worshipped. And so um, this was against Pharaoh because even Pharaoh himself, his household, his firstborn, um, was to be, uh, to be killed, and he, he will be killed in the plague. A little note for those of you who like Discovery Channel uh, and, and History Channel and those types of things, here's, here's a little interesting tidbit. Um, one day I will get to Egypt. I, I really want to go to Egypt, and um, Laura does not, so... I haven't been to Egypt, and so, um, but I want to go. But here's some tidbits about uh, something I think is really neat about this. Um, an inscription was found uh, in a shrine connected with the Great Sphinx that records the solemn promise from the Egyptian gods um, vowing that Thutmose the Fourth would succeed his father, uh, Amenhotep the Second who many believe to be the Pharaoh of Exodus. Okay, so you have, you have this inscription, um, and it's in the museum, it's in Egypt, you can go and see it. Uh, it's, in the outside, uh, it's in the outside museum uh, in the Valley of Kings, if you're interested. Um, one day, maybe I'll show you a picture if Laura ever goes. Um, but this inscription is there, and it's basically saying it, it, it's a spirit it's a swear, it's a promise from all of the gods of Egypt that, uh, that um, Thutmose the fourth will succeed his father, Amenhotep the second. Okay? That's very interesting. That's, that's to you, that's not interesting, I know, right? But to those, and it's not really to me, I'm not an Egyptian scholar, but it's interesting that why would Egyptians' gods have to swear that the son of a pharaoh would become the next pharaoh, right? Pharaoh was in dynasties. If, if pharaoh had a son, he was surely to be, the firstborn was surely to be um, the next pharaoh. Uh, if the firstborn was to die, the secondborn son would be the pharaoh. So uh, there, we, we see no other ever in any um, Egyptian archaeology do we ever see this, but here we have this with this certain pharaoh, Amen, Hometet the second, right? Which is which is the pharaoh of the Exodus, and it's really weird. Well, Sean, why is that weird? I'd love to tell you. Um, this unique promise from the gods that something so natural would happen, right? It's just normal that this would happen, that the eldest son would take place as Pharaoh's um, uh, um, take place as Pharaoh is probably perhaps because Thutmose the fourth was not the father's firstborn son. Amen, Hometep the second had another son. We don't see this son anywhere in Egyptian history, all right? Why is that? Probably because he died, right? He died because he, they did not celebrate Passover. They did not believe in God. And so after his firstborn son died, uh, he probably had another son. Um, or maybe there was a son already born. We, we, we don't know. Um, when you get into the Exodus time, Egyptian history is very vague because, you know, it would be bad to say, uh, the Egyptians lost, you know, two million plus people. Um, but during this time, it's just very weird. And the only time that we see in Egyptian archaeology that the gods swear that they would promise that a son would follow after his father. Well, that would lead us to believe as Christians to say if his 
first son died in the tenth plague, um, then he would feel it a great do to say, to make the gods swear, and he would write out for all of Egypt to see that when he would die, his second son would become uh, Pharaoh, even though he was not the first son, right? So it's just an interesting, interesting thing that's there. Um, you, you know, it's not scripture. You can't put it in there, but it sure does lend itself to believe that, right? So, um, um, but, but, but. so uh, verse 30, and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and his servants in Egypt, and there was a great cry in the land, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. God tried to uh, God tried to inform his mind and his senses, but God had to break it and be soft towards him, right? It's interesting when it says there was a great cry in Egypt. Once again, if you're reading through Exodus, have you, have you read about crying before in the book of Exodus? Oh, how about Israel crying to God, right? How about Israel crying to Pharaoh when he, when he doubled the burden with no straw, right? We see multiple times that the slaves cried out for help and now we see Pharaoh in all of Egypt is crying out for help. So the tables have turned, right? Just an interesting, interesting point. For there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go and serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said. Be gone. Bless me also. Right? A couple of things there. One... Um, we don't know, and I don't know, and I can't tell you, but do you wonder? I wonder. I wonder. You know, Moses and Aaron, they would have got their families right. They would have been celebrating Passover. They smeared the blood. They're eating the, the intestines and the brains, and, you know, they're, they're eating all that delicious goat or lamb that we talked about last week. They're eating it all, and in the middle of the night, there's a knock at the door. Do you answer the door? Do you not answer the door, right? Uh, uh, I, we don't know. But I'm just telling you right now, would Sean answer the door? No, Sean's not answering that door, right? We know that he says that they should not go out the door, but did he open the door and receive, you know, a scroll from Egypt, or was the soldiers just beating on the door, and he says, I'm not opening the door, and, you know, Pharaoh says, get out, you know? Uh, well, you know, we don't know how that goes, but in my mind, I, I want to know, right? One, once again, another question I'll I'll ask when I get to heaven, right? But it's kind of interesting, right? So he goes to them in the middle of the night and says, hey, take your flocks and your herds, go. But notice the last line there, and be gone, and bless me also. This, is, this line is very interesting. Of all, the, of all the plagues, of all the kind of correspondence we've had with Pharaoh and with God and with Moses, now we start to see now, after his son dies, Pharaoh is starting to know who Yahweh really is, right? It, there's been frogs, there's been gnats, there's been lice, there's been boils. I mean, lots of crazy stuff that, you know, most sensible people would say, okay, I, I, I concede. But he hasn't because it hasn't, it hasn't affected him, right? Pharaoh wasn't out shoveling piles of frogs. Remember that? Piles of frogs. Um, because Pharaoh was Pharaoh, right? He had servants to pile that. You know, Nero wasn't shooing gnats. He just had more servants around him with horse tails right? Just shooing that, right? It never affected Pharaoh until now. Now Pharaoh's son dies. And so he says, tell your God uh, to bless me, the God who is greater than Pharaoh. Uh, and he says, do we start to see? Pharaoh is starting to truly understand uh, the power of Yahweh. Verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out in the land in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead, Okay. So all of Egypt, right? Remember, every house, somebody died. And not just them, in every barn, right? In every stable, every animal, anything that was alive, something died, right? So all of Egypt, they're saying, hey, get these guys out of here. And if you remember, we've seen plagues pass a lot of Egyptian court, right? They, they were already ready for them to go, right? Pharaoh, how long will it take you to kick these guys out? Like, we're suffering here. Pharaoh's like, oh, I don't, I don't care. You know, I got, I, I, it's not bothering me, right? But so Egypt was already getting there, but now get out of here. We're all going to be dead if you guys don't leave. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bows being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. Now notice, when are they leaving? It's not at night, okay? 
So don't, don't, don't misread. and says that Pharaoh sent in the middle of the night for Moses, okay? But God told them to not leave out until the next day, right? Until morning, right? So, so don't just say it was in the middle of the night, okay? It was not in the middle of the night. Um, I think anybody of brains would have not come out their door, right, uh, if you were Israel. Uh, so this would have definitely been the next morning. Um, but notice it says, so the people took their dough before it was leavened. This is important. This is why they had to eat unleavened bread, right? The Lord said, eat unleavened bread. Well, we don't like tortillas, right? We want biscuits, right? God said, no, you need to do this. If God wouldn't have done that, if they wouldn't have showed the faith to have their unleavened bread, now Egypt is saying, get out, get out of here, get out. And they're like, no, we got two more hours before my biscuit's ready, right? You'd be like, no, you got to get out now. So once again, it's something to um, it's something to remember that they will continue on for generations and generations, and even to today, we still eat little pieces of styrofoam that we call crackers. Uh, and uh, and I don't care what y'all say, it's styrofoam. We're, we'll find out one day. Uh, and so you kind of have this, right? You have this unleavened bread, but it was it was for a purpose, right? The excess was going to be so fast and so moving. The yeast couldn't rise, right? So God was taking care of them even before. So the dough, before it was um, leavened, their kneading bowls bound up in their cloaks and on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked uh, the Egyptians for silver, gold, jewelry, uh, and for their clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sights of the Egyptians so that they let them have whatever they asked for, okay? So here, for 429 years, right, they've been slaves, and now on the last day, Egypt says, take whatever you want and get out of here, right? And so uh, and you just have to, you know, once again, we'll ask, we'll ask Jesus when we get there, right? But when they found favor. I'd love to know what that means, right? Egypt, I just like see them like just throwing things. Like, please, just leave. Like, you know, there's just like people walking down the street. And they're like, you know, take my cat, you know, and, you know, there's like, take this and take that, and here's my necklace, you know, it's just like, this is my great-grandma's candelabra, take it too, right? It's just amazing, right? So you kind of have this story of all that God is doing, um, and so let them have what they ask. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. What a great word, right? They plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to sackcloth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. So if you convert that, okay, most, and, and we could agree to disagree, but we're going to say, Sean Watts is going to say, from this point forward, it's 2 million people, okay? 600,000 men, you do a little calculating of, of wives and kids, we're going to say roughly around 2 million people. There are people way smarter than me that have smaller numbers, there's people way smarter than me that have bigger numbers, but for the sense of purposes of Sean's extra study, it's 2 million people, okay? And, and, uh, and guess what? That grows, Right? When you have 600,000 men, which probably means that you got, you know, roughly around um, probably a million women and girls, um, they're all fertile, right? They, they continue to, even though they're walking through a desert, you know, guys will be guys, right? And so they will continue to have babies as they, as they walk around, right? So just note of that. Um, so there's about 600,000 men, 2 million people. But notice this, verse 38, a mixed multitude also went up with them and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. Now, a mixed multitude, interesting word. Um, we've seen this word before. It's the Hebrew word, saw rats. Anybody remember what that means? I'm just seeing how good you are. Saw rats. Anybody, don't look back at your notes. Anybody remember what that word is? It means to swarm. It's a creation word, Right? We saw this with the, with the gnats. We saw this with the frogs. I saw rats. It means to swarm. And so this great multitude swarm, a group of people. We don't know how many. Um, some people will include this swarm, this great multitude, the mixed multitude, whatever you want to call it. Some people will include it in that count of 600,000, um, and some do not. If you want Sean Watson's version, I think the Hebrew lens to say it was 600,000 Israel men. And then you have the women and children, and then plus a mixed multitude. Remember, Egypt was three to one, right? So uh, there would have been Egyptians, there would have been Philistines, there would have been all types of people that at this point saw the power of God in the 10th plague, the 9th plague, the 8th plague, the seventh, right? They're all living there, and they say, I'm with you guys, right? The, the, the Egypt's going down. We're on to bigger and, and better things. Now, did 
all of the people of the mixed multitude, did they believe in God? That's a big negative, okay? That's a big negative. And we'll see later on why that's true. But they saw the power of God, and they quickly kind of said, hey, what's going on, right? You got a million people walking down, right? You got a million people walking down Watson saying, we're moving to Forsyth. Right? Two million people walking down Watson say we're giving foresight. And every person in Warner Robins is on both sides of, of Watson, and they're throwing all their money, all their possessions, all their gold. Is there going to be some people that jump in that two million people and say, I think I'm going to go to Forsyth too, right? Every one of us are. We're like, you know what, Forsyth sounds like a good idea. And, you know, you're catching that money, right? It's just kind of common sense, right? But uh, Mixed Multitude also went up with them as much with a lot of livestock. Remember, that livestock was probably all Israel livestock. Most of Egyptians have died, um, but probably whatever they had left was, was taken, um, both flocks and herds. Verse 39, and they baked unleavened cakes of dough because they didn't have time for it to leaven um, that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of the land. No, interesting word. They were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. For 429 days, uh, for, I'm sorry, for 429 years and 364 days, uh, they have been slaves. And literally in just hours, they're kicked out, they're going, they're ready to go. Uh, nobody, um, nobody saw this coming, right? No, they heard, they heard the promises, they knew God was happening, but God would do all of this so quick in the day, um, everybody would have been surprised. Verse 43, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover, Here's what you got to do, right? So now people are walking out and God is still giving provisions of what this Passover feast will be, right? No foreigner shall eat of it. No foreigner shall eat of it. But every slave that is brought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised uh, him. So no foreigner shall eat of it. So what, so what should we do with this mixed multitude, right? The, the, all these Canaanites and Amorites and Pezzarites and, and Amor, you know, all these different people, what are we going to do? Well, when it says that no foreigner shall eat of it, basically it's saying that no non-Israel, non, we would say today a, a non-Jewish person would eat, right? So they would have to, what we would call today, they, they would proselyte them. How would you become a Jew, right? Today, if you wanted to marry a Jew, uh, Ear Erlene just gets a hankering for a Jewish guy, and she wants to marry. She's going to Israel. She might find her an Israelite man, right? She wants to become a Jew. I sure hope you're a Jew who believes in Jesus. Um, but uh, let's say she wants to do. Well, she'd have to do a couple things, right? You have to believe in the law. They don't have the law yet. So what do they do? If this form of what somebody would have to do is they would, um, they, would take the, they would take circumcision, no matter their age, right? Men would become circumcised. Um, and when they become circumcised, they would pledge their allegiance to Yahweh, uh, and then they would be a Jew. So when it says a foreigner, okay, foreigners could take of it, but they would be, have to um, be circumcised, or uh, the man of their house would have to be circumcised, right? So what if you're a woman, Right? What if you're a woman and you say, hey, I wanted to say some women of the mixed multitude wanted to be an Israelite. Uh, they, they couldn't be circumcised, so how, how, would, they, how would they go? They, they wouldn't. Uh, they would not have a man of their house to be circumcised, and so they would not be allowed. Now, when we get to the law, you get to Leviticus, you get to Numbers, there's some provisions made for that. But up until those laws are given, uh, it would strictly be by the man over your house being circumcised and pledging allegiance to Yahweh. Um, so um, it's a bum deal, right? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. After you have circumcised, so if you have a slave, he can eat, but you have to circumcise him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. Um, so somebody just coming in, right? So you just kind of coming in, working, somebody coming through. You can't have that, right? Much like today in the Lord's Supper, right? The Lord's Supper is not for everybody. Everybody in the church on a Sunday morning cannot take the Lord's Supper. You, you must be a believer. You must have faith, right? Um, if you are of, and I know some of you are, you're of an independent um, background. An independent Baptist would say that you have to be a member of this church and be a believer in order to take the Lord's Supper, right? So depending on your background, depending on your theology, both can be argued, but that's for another day, right? So um, it, it shall be eaten in one house, um, 
And you shall not take any of the flesh outside of the house, and you shall not break any of its bone. Remember, the Passover is about a family ordeal, right? It was for, for the family. Um, and uh, it shall, you shall eat all of it. Uh, if you can't eat all of it, you're going to burn it. Uh, you should not break any of its bones, right? That's a new provision. We didn't have that in the first, um, but we see this provision um, given in uh, Psalm 22 and John 19. kind of tells us more about why Jesus is that Passover. Um, remember, if it's going to be a perfect lamb, you're going to have this thing, um, and you're going to sacrifice it. It doesn't need to be messed up, right? And breaking something, of course, would be messing it up. Verse 47, And all the congregation of Israel shall keep it, and all the church, all the ecclesia, it's the New Testament word, right? So all of Israel shall keep all these rules, keep the Passover. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all of his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. Okay? So... Um, if, even if somebody comes in and they're just traveling and they're staying with you, if they're willing to be circumcised, um, hey, have at it, right? So kind of have that idea. Uh, there shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you, right? So there's, there's nothing, there, you can't be like, well, th we're Jews, so we have this, but you're just traveling, so you kind of have a lesser, right? And it's the same standard, right? The same standard across the board, no matter who you are, right? Kind of like salvation, right? The same standard. Jesus is the standard, no matter who you are. Verse 50, all the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded. Once again, this is amazing. As, you can, as we continue to read Exodus, you're going to stop seeing this, right? You're going to stop seeing this a lot. But all the people did as the Lord commanded. Crazy. Um, as, as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that day, the Lord brought the people, out, uh, the, brought the people of Israel out of the land uh, of Egypt, um, Egypt, the land of their host, right? So this is, when you think about it, uh, you kind of have this 429 years and 364 days is kind of like the um, like like a, a pregnant lady, right? And now the plagues were kind of like the birth pains. And, and now on this day, on the, the first day of the 430th year, we have, we have a new baby. We have a new nation. We have um, Israel. Okay. Yum, 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 yum. Sorry, I, got, I got one minute. So um, let's do verses 1 and 2 of chapter 13. Uh, and the Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, who whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both man and of beast, is mine. This word consecrate, this word kadesh, it means to be separate. It means to sacrifice. We see this word used in multiple ways um, in the Old Testament. Um, but basically, it just says to, to be set apart. So the Lord said, consecrate to me, sacrifice to me, set apart to me uh, all of the firstborn. Remember, the plague was the death of the firstborn. And the Passover was the, the saving of the firstborn, okay? So the firstborn was affected. So now, as they're walking out, God's giving them new rules, and he says, okay, so here's what you're going to do, right? You're not only going to keep the Passover, not only got unleavened bread and the lamb and the blood, okay, all this, but now I want you to consecrate to me. I want you to sacrifice. I want you to set apart to me the firstborn, this does not mean that all the rest were exempt, okay? It's not what it means. It just means that, like, we would say the Sabbath day or Sunday, the first day of the week, right, we give that to the Lord. Uh, we see Joseph, right, um, in Pharaoh's dreams, right? You have the first of the corn, right? You, they, would, they would take that apart. They would tax that back in Pharaoh's day. Um, we would say today... Um, and in Old Testament terms, a tithe, right? You get, you get your money, you give a tenth, the first tenth, in faith that God will use the rest of the ninth that, that you don't need that tenth, right? So it's, that's kind of the word that we're using here, consecrate, sacrifice. Um, but we will see next week that there is some true sacrificing to be made, right? Not talking about kids, but... Um, so if you have bad kids, you can't sacrifice them. Um, but that's right. So whatever is first to open in the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, notice this, is mine. Right? God says they are, they are mine. They are his. Israel is God's firstborn. Exodus chapter 4, 22, right? Israel is God's firstborn. So the firstborn was thought to be the best. 
and the remainder of the future generations that God redeemed are his firstborn, right? So this idea of them redeeming, of sacrificing the firstborn of every family, of every animal, of every this, basically just shows for generation and generation that they would always be setting apart for Christ, right? So this, I not for God, they didn't know who Christ was, but that's eventually the, the, the point. But you kind of have this idea that if God says, set apart to me the firstborn, right? So the people walking out of Egypt, when they have kids, and they're going to have kids in the desert, ever, almost all of them will, they'll have kids, and they set apart those kids, right? And now when those kids have kids, and then they get to go over into the promised land, what are they going to do? They're going to, they're going to set apart, sacrifice, consecrate their kids for God, and we can see this continual. So it's a purpose of not only saying the first is the best and you shall give your first to God, but it's also a way of key saying of God saying, I'm going to make sure for generation after generation, people will know who Yahweh is. And why will they know? Because we're consecrating. Dad, why, why are we doing this big thing? Why are we consecrating? Why are we sacrificing this animal? Because, um, because I was born. Okay, well, here's why. Because Back in the day, there we were slaves, and God bless it. Always points back to the deliverance. It always points back to the Passover, and so it just continues away. So, not only is the Passover a way that every year they would remember the Passover, they would remember the sacrifice, but then consecrating the firstborn every generation of animals and of humans, right? So, if you have a flock and you have a firstborn of this cat, right? It would happen a lot. It's not just you know. And for us, we have a you know couple kids, right? Back then, they had lots of kids, right? And so uh, it happened way more than you would think, but it would be a way that would constantly keep God in the foreth forethought of the family uh, and of, of their neighbors and of the community always giving to God. Um, and we're going to stop right there, and then uh, it'll be a good place as we move um, next week. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. We thank you as we look over into the Passover that even though it happened so long ago, even though we think of maybe uh, a, a movie with Charlton Heston, and we, when we think of Exodus, we think of Burning Bush, and we think of Mount Sinai, but, but it was really the beginning of showing us your love, that you loved us so much that you have set apart a way for us to not die, for us to be saved through the blood. Father, we thank you that we are not like Israel back then. That we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to be the ultimate Passover lamb. That every year we don't have to sacrifice an animal in just waiting for something better. But Father, on this side of the cross, we know that there is something better. We know that you have sent the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Father, we pray that we would be like these Israelites are right now, that they would hear the word of God, they would worship, and they would immediately act. Father, help us to be able to hear your word and to worship your word and to act upon your word. Father, we thank you for the true lamb. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made so that we would not die. Father, we thank you. In your name, amen. All right. God bless.